again, sorry everyone if I'll be in and out. Internet's really bad in the Philippines. Oh, recording's on. <laughs> okay, sure. So, um, yeah, so welcome again, everyone, to our anti carceral feminism discussion tonight. Um, it will be about sex work and the need to abolish the rescue industry. So, this event again is organized by us in Abolition. And we're glad to have everyone uh, joining us tonight uh, with our very great speakers and learning with each other as we go along. So yeah, for our first speaker, um, let me introduce them, uh, her I mean. Uh, yeah, so it's Dr. Sharmila Parmanand. Uh, she has a PhD in multidisciplinary gender studies from the University of Cambridge and her doctoral research is very relevant to this topic. It's, you could say it's even um, extremely related about it precisely. So it's about uh, exam uh, she examined sex trafficking discourses and interventions in the Philippines from a critical perspective. So I won't take too much of your time. Um, let's hear it from Dr. Sharmila. Thank you very much for having me, Abolition, and also thank you very much for creating this space because it is such an important intervention um, and we have so little of it, right? Uh, may I just ask for permission to share my screen? I think the host needs to let me. Thank you. All right. Um, hang on. So I have a quick presentation for you today. Um, and so that is what I am sharing. Uh, I assume people can see this. Uh, let me just, I mean, this should be okay. Uh, yes, slideshow, sorry. Cool, here we go. Um, okay, so the title of this, you know, bit that I want to share today is rights not rescue so precisely to speak to the question of labor to view sex work as labor rather than victimhood I'm also really sorry it's been bright and sunny today um, before that I do want to thank uh, the Philippine sex workers, sex workers collective and um, all the other sex workers who worked with me on this dissertation you know academia sometimes is very very extractive in the sense that we do research we benefit from the knowledge and information and insight of communities. And then, you know, we publish that work and we professionally succeed from that. And then the community is still there, right? So in my research, I was very conscious of this and, you know, have tried as much as possible to minimize that extractiveness of the research. So I want to emphasize this knowledge was produced alongside, right? The Philippine Sex Workers Collective, they are my partners here. And unlike your, you know, traditional model of doing research and your anti-traffickers who treat, you know, sex workers as objects of rescue, to me, they are not. They are partners. They are, they are authorities on their own lives. And what they have to say is important. In fact, I think it should be driving the conversation. So that is the premise of this, right? And so I want to acknowledge them because it is a bit of, you know, it's unfortunate that they can't be here speaking about this because of criminalization and because of stigma. And so you're stuck with me instead, but they would probably do a much better job of representing themselves. So that's, that's the elephant in the room, right? Cool. Some background on myself. I was not always like this in terms of my views on sex work. And in some ways, this is a bit of an atonement journey. I used to actually work in anti-trafficking in the Philippines as a leading, um, you know, as a leading policy person in one of these big NGOs. And I used to, at one point, think that sex work was universally victimizing. And I'm really embarrassed to admit that now. I also used to have very um, simplistic understandings of it as largely women doing sex work. But obviously, in my experience there, there were many things that really disturbed me. And I'm happy to elaborate on that later on that kind of made me realize that this is wrong. And we need we need to change this perspective. We're not we're actually doing harm. We're not helping. And so I had to like ex exit that space because there was so much gatekeeping there that there was no space for this kind of alternative view to to be heard. Right. So I had to leave that and I had to go into academia and do the research there. And then now I'm trying to re-enter um, the activist space with this data now. Right. Um, basically, in the Philippines, there is a legal ambiguity on sex work. So the Revised Penal Code of 1930 still considers it a crime to sell sex. But if you look at the, the more recent anti-trafficking law and Magna Carta of Women, it essentially says someone who sells sex is a victim, right? Uh, it is actually the clients and the managers and third parties who need to be criminalized. 
if you look at the labor code and the sanitation code, it suggests that sex workers are workers and kind of are economic assets, right? So it's a hot mess. You have this legal limbo. And obviously when you have legal limbos, who takes advantage of that? The cops firm foremost, right? And then you also have like confusing legislation on a local level. But despite all of these ways of talking about sex workers and writing them into policies, at no point were sex workers consulted. And this was my biggest discomfort, right? They're completely excluded from this conversation through various maneuvers. One, regularly pathological like you're too damaged, you're too traumatized to know what is in your best interest. Therefore, I, the arrogant feminist, will tell you what is in your best interest, which is to exit. Or those who do manage to speak up are then portrayed as too privileged. Oh, because you can speak up, then therefore it means you are actually not as disadvantaged as those poor women who are being locked up and abducted. Therefore, also you have no credibility. Second, I don't know if this is public knowledge, but it really should be. US funding, I mean, you know, for all the talk of the left on sex work and empire and westernization and racialization of sex work, empire operates in many ways. And the US government has exported its carceral model of imprisoning people, right, um, to the Philippines and to other countries through donor funding, because USAID to some extent is captured by the right, right? Like, and so if you accept if you're operating in foreign countries and you receive funds for anti-trafficking or HIV prevention, you are not allowed at any point to endorse the decriminalization or legalization of prostitution. It is in their contract. And I'm happy to share that after this event, you have to sign a contract that says you do not support prostitution, which means organic and the US being the biggest donor in these spaces literally means that organizations in this space have a financial incentive to not support prostitution. Or if that's not gatekeeping, I'm not sure what is, right? Uh, the other thing is, so someone in the chat says, look, um, sex work is not all sex trafficking. Absolutely. Except what's happened is in the, sorry, in the um, process by which we were passing all of these laws that, you know, suggest that everyone in sex work is a victim, the, the, the testimonies of trafficking survivors were heavily deployed and weaponized by organizations like the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, Asia Pacific, which by the way, is an offshoot of a US organization, but sure, let's talk about imperialism. Um, and so these testimonies of survivors, which you know I argue are valuable, obviously this is important, but this is not the whole story, right? In the same way you have trafficking in domestic work or factory work, it doesn't mean we identify those victims and say that they speak for the entire industry and thus we must ban domestic work and factory work, but that's exactly what happened with sex work, right? So sex workers were excluded and there was discursive privilege largely for trafficking survivors. And again, I say, compare this to other precarious workers, this is not the approach that we took to migrants. This is not the approach that we took to domestic workers. In those situations, we wanted them to unionize. We wanted them to mobilize for more rights. We recognize the dignity of their work and the need for more protection, not restriction. But why is it that with sex work that we're taking a different track? And my argument is a lot of it has to do with A, US funding and B, anxieties around sex that we're not recognizing. So very briefly, how is sex work rec uh, represented, right? seen as violence against women, the choice is entirely undermined by poverty and desperation. Now, this is partially true. Like, obviously, poverty is a big factor in many uh, individuals' choice to enter sex work. I'm also really uncomfortable with the generalization that it's exclusively women, because it really isn't, right? Now, to be fair to these feminists, like Katwap and uh, the anti-trafficking sector, and that this is the most I'm going to go, perhaps the intention here was our point of reference is that they are seen as criminals. So perhaps we are, according to them, better off seeing them as victims instead, because that's a better comparative, because at least there's a sympathetic shift, right? But what they support is still partial criminalization. So don't be fooled. They call it decriminalization. It's not, because what they are decriminalizing is the sale, but the buying and the third parties are still criminalized, which means you still drive the entire transaction underground and it's still stigmatized, right? Like so. But they're saying like, maybe this is still better. It's a sympathetic shift. So I had to sit with this for a while and really reflect on this. But ultimately my answer is it's not. Why? The way we define the problem shapes our solution. So if you've locked them into the position of victim and locked yourselves into the position of rescuers and saviors, then the common interventions we are going to endorse will be raids and rescue and rehab and redirecting them to other jobs. And as someone said as well in the chat, we're just creating distinctions again among women. So those who, you know, conform to the performance of victimhood, who demonstrate victimhood, those who look innocent and pure and who are crying and who are trafficked, 
are then seen as deserving of help and protection, but those who don't are still not seen as deserving of protection. So we've just transferred the problem into good versus bad women, right? And you know what, to be honest, in my research, not much time to get into that, but there's a very blurred line between rescue and arrest, because a lot of these women experience rescue essentially as arrest. Some of them are even jailed because anti-trafficking rates are just refashioned. You know, these are anti-sex work rates, they're just refashioned into anti-trafficking, but ultimately the women end up in jail anyway, or shelter and detention because they're not allowed to leave detention centers. There's a lot of moral policing that's happened. They're redirected to low paying jobs. And I'll say something about that in a bit. Bottom line is, in this approach, there's a prominent role for cops. And I am going to argue this is always a bad thing and, and we'll see why, right? Um, let's talk about the whole choice versus coercion thing. I think it's a misnomer, right? Like, um, you know, there is a mixture of choice and coercion in a lot of work, in a lot of precarious work. Very few of us actually end up doing the work that we absolutely love. That is a mark of privilege. And I actually argue for a lot of the women I spoke to, the decision to enter sex work was careful and considered and very rational, right? Many were single mothers, single for a significant period of time, worked in factories and worked in domestic work first. And, you know, in a factory, they say, look, if I'm late for five minutes, it's a salary deduction. If I don't meet my production quota for the day, that's a salary deduction. I have five minutes for bathroom break. I develop UTI. I develop arthritis, back pain. If my son is sick and, you know, my young children are sick, I can't even like take time off to care for them, whereas sex work is more flexible. There are higher RD rates. These workers also experience sexual harassment in domestic work, in retail work. It's a lie that women, you know, poor women don't experience that in these occupations. Some of them who worked overseas as, over, as, as domestic workers were in debt in order to, you know, be able to secure their contracts and training and they had to pay all these training and placement fees. And then you're in a foreign country, you're not a citizen, you have no legal protections. The moment you complain against your boss, they're just going to turn the charges on you. Your visa in some countries is tied to their you know, to your employment contract. And then if you leave, you come back, you restart the cycle of debt, right? So, and they ask me, what if we prefer this life to that life? Why are the feminists telling us that those alternatives are better? In our judgment, they are not. And we have no right to tell them otherwise, unless we're able to give them better alternatives, right? Some of them would also, so they, they found sex work to actually be less dehumanizing. And some of them would also say, we're not selling ourselves. So this is a stupid, like, metaphor of like you're selling yourself they're like what even i've sold my body it's still here with me right they're selling their services but it's a there's a constant refusal to conflate sexual acts with people's identities which is a problem like in fact you are re-inscribing something that we as feminists are supposedly meant to be fighting right conflating people people's identities with their sex which happens mostly with women no one thinks men lose essential aspects of their identity when when they have sex you know, some of them also found it to be personally rewarding. Now, to be, to be clear, in my research, I worked a lot with street workers and establishment-based workers. It was a conscious decision I made because I wanted to engage with the anti-trafficking sector on their terms. I looked at their paradigmatic case studies, the prototype, supposedly the poor and most vulnerable ones, and to tell them, even on your terms, you're wrong. I didn't even look at you know, the higher end call center uh, escorts and, 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 and freelance individual sex workers who have a lot more social capital and a bit more, a bit more safety in their working conditions. So I didn't even touch that, right? I'm, I'm talking about the more vulnerable ones here. So ultimately, my argument is, look, we must assess this relative to their realistic uh, alternatives, and we have no right to tell them that it is the worst option for them. Now there's this perception that sex work is dangerous. Obviously it is, right? We're not, we're not gonna lie about that, but we need to unpack where does this danger come from? And a lot of them would say, if I wasn't illegal, I wouldn't have to depend on my manager because this manager is the person who transacts with the cops and transacts with the clients to make sure that they don't take advantage of me. When I asked, and I spoke predominantly to women, that's a failing of my research method, but I, I didn't have access to other networks at that point. When I asked, who their biggest threats were, what they were most afraid of. The argument that what I constantly got was it's the police. It's not the clients, it's not the third parties. Obviously there's threat there too, but the predominant answer is the cops who take advantage of them, extort money from them, you know, do not respect them and tell them they don't deserve uh, any assistance because what do you expect? You're a sex worker. So don't, we, this crazy dissonance which feminists refuse to recognize, right? Like 
cops are the biggest source of threat, and yet we continue to support alternative. Uh, we continue to support approaches that put cops at the front and center, the front lines of rescuing sex workers. It's absurd. So my argument here is that carceral approach actually endangers, increases danger, and it also frames the problem incorrectly because we start thinking of it as trafficking and exploitation is you have one victim and you have one villain, and the solution is to jail that villain who is usually also like some poor headhunter who's not actually like responsible primarily and in some cases actually helping people find a job. Although I also don't want to romanticize third parties because some of them are indeed exploitative. But that's not how we should be thinking about the problem. It's an economic justice problem, right? But like by focusing on individualistic criminal justice and carceral solutions, we, we give the state a free pass. We allow it to look like a rescuer. It's not a rescuer in this equation. It's actually failed. It's failed those sex workers, right? And in fact, even in the rehab process, rehab, a lot of these women are made to feel and actually told that their, you know, their assistance from the state is conditional on their cooperation with the prosecution um, to pin down the perps. And even in some cases, like they're not released from their detention centers until they've been able to testify. So this rehab process is a softer face, but it's actually essentially criminal justice to be branded, right? And again, problem. And in rehab, they are pushed into alternatives that are low paid, labor intensive, also gendered, right? Domestic work, sewing, hairdressing, factory, how many hairdressers can you have in one village really? But at least there's no sex. But actually, like, are we really helping them? There's been no systematic work to show that all this money that's gone into rehab has actually improved lives for these women. In fact, it's outed them to their communities, exposed them to, exposed them to traumatizing raid and rescue operations, dislocated them from their work. Um, at what cost, unclear. So I'm gonna ask, what is the feminist agenda here? And I do think we need a course correction in, in our brand of feminism in the Philippines. Here are some quotes from sex workers in my work. I'm gonna translate them into English. So this is what I was asking. One, my job is dignified. Um, I feed my family with it. I don't steal money, unlike politicians and cops. Why would I be ashamed? Second, why do we treat overseas Filipino workers as you know modern heroes, but then treat sex workers as cancers and social pests? We're all trying to raise our kids and feed our kids. Why won't you count our contribution too? Next, they'll say I'm a bad mother because I'm a sex worker, but then they'll also say I'm a bad mother if my child is starving and not able to go to school. That's also bad, so I can't ever win. Um, next, my children, I am able to feed them with are you able to feed them with your clean money? Don't you as a society benefit from our dirty money? Um, this one, I, that this one really stayed with me. What job involves the risk of violence, involves the risk of having to perform sex acts and give blow jobs, even if you don't want to, and for free? That happens when you're someone's wife sometimes, right? So this sex worker was saying, look, domestic violence is common in marriages, but we haven't banned marriages, right? Um, don't talk about us. You sh this is none of your business. It's not your vaginas that are getting pounded. Last two. Let's admit this to each other, right? Um, we all know that a lot of those women in showbiz, I think this person was talking in particular about Gretchen Barreto, um, whore themselves out to politicians. Um, and businessmen, but they do it in a really high class way, right? And so we enjoy watching them on TV. In fact, we respect the hustle and, you know, reward them for their resourcefulness and their craftiness. But because I'm not high class and because I do it in a very direct and apparent way, then that's not okay anymore. Finally, I don't need to defend the morality of my clients in order to be entitled to labor rights. Like factory owners are sometimes really bad humans, but that's not an argument for us to tell people they can't work in factories. Last slide. Recommendations. I think we do need to have viable exit options for sex workers. So not these fake exit options of, oh, maybe you can sew bracelets and bake jam. I mean, make jam and like sew rags because they don't make money from this. And this is really labor intensive, but it should not be coercive and it should not be conditional. So here's the problem. Sex workers go ask for help. The first thing they're told is, you can only avail of it when you leave sex work, but that exit has to be on their terms. So these alternatives should not be coercive. I mean, I understand that the entry into sex work can be coercive for some, but then this forced exit is also coercive and we have to weigh them up against each other, right? Second, we need to focus on political agency, like focus on the work part instead of the sex part, treat it as a labor category. We need to invest in giving sex workers space to organize and collectivize. They do not have that space at the moment. Um, 
And also we need to recognize their contributions. Like sex workers in the Philippines were the first to welcome trans individuals, single mothers, people with HIV, marginalized identities, and like to welcome them into their fold and, fo and form mutual aid communities long before these causes became cool, right? So why are we erasing those contributions? I, I do think instead of helping and saving, it's about creating space so they can represent themselves. And, uh, and in keeping with the theme of this event, we really need to minimize interactions between sex workers and the police and disempower the police in relation to sex work, well, and most marginalized groups, to be honest. I'll stop here for now, but thank you for the space. And again, a lot of this, thanks to the Philippine Sex Workers Collective as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharmila, for everything. Basically, it was such an informative and powerful and really just on point discussion and all on sex work um yeah i mean i feel like everyone learned so much and uh i myself am just so amazed at the methodology and the excerpts that were shown uh, i i think that they really encapsulate and um exemplify what sentiments we may have been um either ignoring or um just generally not aware of because of how the discourse and the conversations on this topic have been um shaped by the things around us, by the structures that uh, are around us and control, I guess, how we see things. Um, so for everyone who has a question, um, we can redirect our questions again to the Padlet. Uh, thank you, Magsalin, for sharing the Padlet again in our chat. So um, if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Sharmila, you can just go to the Padlet, um, post it there. If you have any comments as well, any clarifications you wanted to ask. Um, but for now, I guess we'll be moving on to our next speaker, um, who I'm sure will also give us um, such a good um, way to think about and talk about the conversation we're having now, sex work. So Purple Rose is a Filipino, uh, Filipinex trans woman and an activist who promotes an abolitionist and anti-carceral feminist politics. So um, everyone, yeah, let's welcome Purple Rose uh, and give, her, uh, give them the floor. Hi, um, Dr. Shamila, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for saying so much in such a short amount of time. And like, I just, I'm blown away right now. So thank you so much for like presenting that research. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me here. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I wanted to start off by sharing a story about how a couple of years ago, I was on a train and because of like the I was like going through um through like the Midwest of the United States and because the dining car had limited capacity they sat me and my friend down with a stranger and we met this woman and as we do a lot in the U.S. we like talked about like what we do for work and she shared um a couple of the things she does right and she said that she frees women and children and rescues them from sexual slavery and um that it's actually really dangerous work and she actually has to go into the streets right to find these enslaved women right and she has to rescue them from pimps and traffickers and get them into rehabilitation programs right and that it's actually really really hard work too because part of that rehabilitation is actually convincing them that they are slaves and um you know like i don't know there's like this white woman from phoenix and she has like this like pink streak in her hair and i was like i do not like these are so many red flags for me right but my best friend right he's there and he's just nodding his head and going oh wow that sounds really hard thank you so much for doing that work and um after we have you know after we leave you know i pull my friend aside right my best friend you know and i tell him i was like alex like you don't know this right but what she was saying is is wrong um and actually evil like it's it's to a level like i was you know trying to explain to him i was like there's anti-traffic in politics right and that when she what she's doing like i don't know exactly what she was doing but i know that like there was like so much wrong there a 
couple years later, right, just this last summer, I was doing research on like anti-trafficking stuff, right? And I came across this picture and I had lunch with this woman and it blew my mind. <laughs> I was like, what? Like she, we had this whole conversation and I learned that what she did in Phoenix was um, something called Project Rose, which was a rescue program. Um, and then um, there's going to be a slight trigger warning for um, the the next section. So um, talking a little bit, just like about like that rescue program. Um, and so like what she did is she actually set up like a police sting, and she what. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so she set up a police sting, right, as a social worker, right? And they actually arrested dozens um, or even hundreds of sex workers from the street, right, and trafficked them to the basement of a church. And I actually got a copy of her own published research about this. And she calls all of the sex workers, um, either prostitutes or research subjects, right? One had to immediately was had to go to the hospital because of her injuries, right? Which makes it seem like she was probably like abused, like faced police violence, right? On the way there. Another person, right? She wrote about was very enthusiastic to finish the program so that she could get her daughter back, right? And this social worker <laughs> like opened this prostitution case, right? And is holding the sex workers daughter for ransom in order to complete her 40-hour prostitution alternative arrest program. Um, and it's, um, we wouldn't really know about this though if it wasn't for Monica Jones, um, who is a black trans woman who was arrested into this program, right? And she spoke out about it and she faced retaliation from Dominic Rose, was re-arrested after the program. And there's so much information because she decided to stand up, right? And she decided to call all that out. Um, unfortunately, the anti-trafficking industry is not accountable to anybody, right? And while Monica Jones did get that program shut down, Dominique is still getting a grants to do research, is still publishing and um, trying to get these programs in place. Um, yeah. Uh, this is Janice Raymond. Um, she is another um, anti-trafficking person. So she actually founded the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women. And uh, that is actually one of like the US funded um, nonprofits, right, that actually goes throughout the world, right, and they were very active in the Philippines, right, to get the criminalization of sex work. And that they would withhold funds, right, or they would get like the, you know, the uh, US to withhold aid um from you know if you know countries didn't criminalize sex work right um and she also <laughs> is one of like the original we call them TERFs um trans exclusionary radical feminists right and so she wrote this right and she said I contend that the I'll contend um that the problem of transsexualism would be best be served by morally mandating it out of existence this means I want to eliminate the medical and social systems that support transsexualism. And I feel like this is also her approach, right, to sex workers, right? She wants to eliminate the social systems, right, that support sex workers, right, which is, you know, the clients, right, which is like access to things, right, that she wants to morally mandate it out of existence, right? But the thing is like trans women of color in here in the US in the belly of the beast, um, we have been relying on sex work for decades. So this is Silver Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson and they are um, credited with starting the Stonewall Riots, which is uh, what Pride is supposed to commemorate every year. Um, so they kind of, really started like a whole queer revolution, right? And what they were doing is that they were fighting against police, 
right, who were harassing them for being trans, right, but also harassing them for being sex workers, right, and that the laws that, um, you know, police use against trans women, right, still today, right, are anti-sex work laws, right, these go hand in hand. Um, and then they also started STAR, which is the Street Transvestites Action Revolutionaries, and the STAR House. So they would actually house homeless, trans, and queer youth, right? And they would use the money that they got from doing sex work to house the community. Um, and then I'm going to show a video um, next um, of Silver Rivera speaking out at... Um, Pride just a few years after Stonewall, right? So they literally started Stonewall and then white lesbians, white gay men, right? People like, exactly like, um, who was I just talking about? <laughs> um, what's her name? Janice Raymond, right? People just like Janice Raymond, right? Were kicking trans women, literally Sylvia Rivera out of Pride and keeping her from actually speaking out. Um, and I feel like this history is really important and also just, it's a great video. It's going to be about four minutes long. There is quite a bit of shouting at the beginning and arguing. Um, so if you find that to be triggering, I recommend that you turn your volume down, um, at least for like the beginning part before, like she really kind of gets up there and starts her speech. And then I just need one second to switch my mic over. Um, wait, I remember how to do this. <laughs> One second. I believe in a revolution. 
for draw to. I believe in the gay power. I believe in us getting our rights or else I would not be out there fighting for our rights. That's all I wanted to say to your people. If you all want to know about the people that are in jail and do not forget Bambi Lamore and Dora Mark, Kenny Messner, and other gay people are in jail, come and see the people at Star House on 12th Street, on 640 East 12th Street, between B and C, apartment 14. The people that are trying to do something for all of us and not men and women that belong to a white middle class, white club, and that's what you all belong to. Revolution now! Give me the key! Give me the name! Give me a Y! Give me a P! Give me an O! Give me a W! Give me an A! Give me an O! Give me a W! Give me a W! I love that video um, and I love the ferocity, right? And it's like, we're still fighting those same people, right? It's like, we're still fighting Janice Raymond, right? We don't know that we are, right? Because we don't know who's in charge of these NGOs. We don't know, right, who is doing a lot of these things, right? But Janice Raymond has become only more powerful in the last 30 years, the more that we've forgotten about her. And it's, um, you know, and it's like, if we only listen, right, to these people, right, if we only listen to carceral feminists on their terms, right, you know, like my best friend, right, he loves me, right, he knows I'm a sex worker, he would never, you know, be complicit on purpose to like, you know, be a part of something that would harm, you know, our community like that, right. But we have to look right behind at what's actually going on, right? And that they use all these words and euphemisms, right? But that there's actually like this whole other thing based on experience, right? And we just have to listen to the sex workers, right? And that we have to like realize that like we've been fighting <laughs> this for decades, right? And that we've been winning, right? And leading like whole like queer revolutions, right? Together. And so like when I think about like, you know, what exactly is anti-carceral feminism. You know, it's like we can think about, you know, trying to take down Cat W. We can try to think about like trying to take down, right, these things, right, confronting carceral feminism in our communities. But really, I think what it comes down to is anti-carceral feminism is love and love of sex workers and that we need to, you know, have sex workers in our communities, right? And that it's like, actually, like, we, we got to stop thinking of sex workers, right, as just victims, because it's like sex workers have figured out how to survive completely on the margins, right? How to organize against police, right? Against police brutality, right? How to organize, right? Against the state, how to survive, how to take care of each other, right? How to house each other, right? And so what I want you to think about is with sex workers, you need them in your community because it makes your community that much stronger, right? As we fight for abolition, right? As we fight against the police. And we have a lot of lessons to learn, right? And that when we see sex workers, right, in trouble, right, when we see people who are in desperate situations, we don't call the cops, right? We don't call social workers in, right? Those are just meant to disappear problems, right? So that people don't see them anymore, right? But that's not what happens, right? So we need to be housing sex workers, right? You need to be living with them, like you need to, like, to be loving our community. And I will all be like that much stronger for it. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming here and um, yeah, giving me a chance to speak.
thank you, Purple Rose, for uh, that discussion. Uh, both your insights as well as the video that you showed us was really, really informative and interesting. And I think everyone uh, not only learned a lot, but also felt, uh, or ideally, felt a bit um, more empathetic and understanding and moved in general to um, consider the realities that we don't really experience or face in our own lives. So with that, um, we will be stopping the recording uh, just so we can have a freer, more open discussion, I guess, uh, especially with your questions and answers. Um,